Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. This week on the podcast, what can I say? Funny story, Jeffrey Sherman, he's been on the podcast before. Um, I've had been on his podcast, The Sherman Show, before. The very first Masters in Business broadcast was just about a decade ago, and that was his boss, Jeffrey Gunlock, uh, founder of Double Line Capital, back in July 2014. So he just flew in late yesterday. The calendar was a little tight. They got here a little late. They had to leave a little early. I apologize in advance if it sounds like I'm jumping in trying to get to the next question. I have pages and pages of topics to talk to him about and a very limited amount of time um, to get to it. So if it sounds like I am leaping in to push him forwards, I am. Um, He was super generous with his time. He was supposed to leave about 25 minutes to go to his next appointment, but we just kept going. There are few people who understand both fixed income and equity investment and quantitative strategies to each better than Jeffrey Sherman. He really is one of the most knowledgeable people in this space and not just knowledgeable in the abstract, but helping to oversee just about $100 billion in client assets. Really just a tour de force discussion. I I find his take very insightful, very refreshing. I love the approach of just throwing everything out the window and going back to first principles on occasion. Double Line is known for that. Just a delightful conversation, so informative. With no further ado, my discussion with Jeffrey Sherman, Double Line's Deputy Chief Investment Officer. Thanks, Barry. It's good to be back. It's good to have you. So, you know, the last time we spoke, we were really talking about funds and and bonds and really got into the minutia. But I want to roll back a little bit and talk about your background, which is really kind of interesting. Undergraduate applied mathematics, master's degree in financial engineering, a little bit of of teaching. Uh, What was the original career plan? What were you thinking? Um, So prior to going to graduate school, I was looking at becoming a teacher. Everybody told me that if you get a degree in mathematics, the, the world's your oyster. Mm-hmm. And um, I didn't really see it, to be honest, uh, originally. Really? You know, because uh, I started off in what was the discipline of pure mathematics. So mm-hmm. pure mathematics for the uninitiated is essentially proving everything you've already learned. <laughs> <laughs> and so you go back and you have to go back to the basics and the principles. And it's, it's just a lot of logic at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And trying to make that connection to how to be employed very difficult uh, for for especially for like a 19 20 year old um, who has no clue what's what's out there in the world and it's so, like studying philosophy you, you could be a philosophy professor but that's pretty much it right but also like there's there's a lot of overlap between philosophy and a pure mathematician as well and, and again it comes mm-hmm. down to logic and, mm-hmm. and you know the deduction of arguments but you moved to applied mathematics I did and I I did looking for something different and I I just didn't see much there and further to that, uh, I was on the track to become a teacher. So I was, I thought, you know, hey, I'll be a high school baseball coach, high school teacher. Seems interesting. And I, I have to thank the university for forcing us to go actually sit in classrooms. Uh-huh. And so, I, and I don't mean attending class for your own education, but I meant if you want to teach, you have to go to the local school. Order a course, watch a teacher do what you're studying to do and say, hey, is this for me? Yeah, and I realized the repetition, <laughs> the redundancy, also the lunacy of trying to babysit teenagers. Right. And so um, I was very turned off by it. And so that was actually the transition to, to applied mathematics to try to find a different career. Um, and what they don't tell you about applied mathematics is you can apply it to things, but it's not blatantly obvious what said application is. And so uh, effectively, you know, by the time I became a senior, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, and time was rolling around, and I really hadn't applied for a job. So the natural thing was, well, let's just stay in academia. And so that's what I did. Um, I actually uh, started off in a PhD in applied mathematics, uh-huh. and um, I like to say I'm a dropout. I, I I didn't really see the path of becoming a professor at the you know kind of at the university level because again I still felt there was that redundancy and it, it just didn't it didn't seem to 
you know, elicit some spark inside of me. So how do you go from a PhD program to financial engineering masters? Yeah. Well, what it was was, uh, so I, as I said, with applications, there's many applications of math. Um, and the usually obvious one is physics. And I really hated physics. I really? never really liked physics. And um, it was just something that didn't intrigue me. So I spent a lot of time in probability and statistics which probability is very wonky. Statistics, the people think they're the same. They're no, actually they're completely absolutely different, not, right. absolutely different fields. But I'd done a lot of econometrics and, and things like that. And so from the standpoint of statistics, uh, that was one of my specialties in addition to calculus. And so really I was focused on applied during the, the route of differential equations and, and calculus-based uh, stuff. And at the time, this was the late 90s, obviously quants were becoming bigger and bigger part of the financial industry. And so there was starting to become these programs on, on like financial math and, and more applied. Usually it was like a, you know, a, a University of Chicago, which, again, I didn't have a lot of exposure to these you know, prestigious universities and didn't know about a lot of this. And so I was looking at like a Carnegie Mellon and the likes. So they ended up going back to a school in L.A. called Claremont. Mm -hmm. um, and they had a financial engineering program there. And so I was always concerned, well, I haven't studied accounting finance over the time. And um, the advisor there gave me some great advice. said, we can teach mathematicians finance. We can't always teach <laughs> finance majors math. And so- um, That's so I, funny. I, I, it's I, so true. It, 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 there is something about it. Um, it's an easier transition. I, I won't say you can't teach them. It's just uh, the finance was a lot easier when you studied a lot of math for a long time. And the applications were, were absolutely directly applicable. It, it seems that some people are math people and some people are not. And- you know, if it comes to you naturally, you don't understand why other people don't, don't. get the fundament. Like, it, there's an internal logic that makes so much sense if you're one of those people. And if you're not, you know, it's Greek. To, to and, and also, it was something that I was always kind of gifted with, right? The, the math came easier. Uh, the reason I became a math major, Barry, is that I actually disliked reading by the time I got to college. I, no it was kidding. really And obviously, think about it, finance never have to read, right? We don't have to read anything in there. Um, but I, I was actually floored by when I got my first job as an intern and the amount of reading that I had to do in a given day. And I was like, wow, you know, I chose math because it was very simple. It, it came natural. It was like, um, you know, you read a couple of pages, you do some problems, it's over. I don't have to read, you know, hundreds of pages of a novel. Um, but very quickly, I learned that um, you, you definitely have to read uh, day in, day out. And, and, so, and a, a poorly written novel with a terrible narrative plot structure and awful characters, right? That, that, that's finance <laughs> in a nutshell, right? So so definitely, um, you know, again, that's just being young and naive as well. But, you know, it, you should always gravitate to some of your internal skill set. And that that's what I did. But I, I think the people who told me that you can always do stuff with a math degree, but I also really cursed them for a while, not tell me what that exactly was. And by the way, when I heard you can become an engineer, I never wanted to drive a train, right? <laughs> and so no one ever told me what an engineer was actually doing. It's that the, the definition of engineer is using math to solve problems, exactly. right? Real world problems. And so I, I don't know if financial engineering holds up as well because I don't know if they're the real world problems, but I definitely know there are problems there and there are things we can help in the world by doing you, so. You mentioned you were an intern. Yeah. Where did you start your internship and was it was it in the world of finance? It was, it was. Um, so, uh, so... When I was uh, in the master's program, require an internship as part of it, and uh, I got it at Trust Company of the West, so TCW. Oh, and, and so, so so that was your first job. Yeah, also. my first job was there, and I've worked with the same crew effectively ever since. So that was in uh, that was in two thousand and one, early then, and then ultimately, um, you know, I've been working with the same team around me for about twenty five years now. That's amazing. How did you bump into some kid named Jeff Gunlock there? Well, he, he was uh, he was a lot older than me. He mm -hmm. was not a kid at the time, too, but uh, he definitely had gravitas around the firm. And uh, I, I think there's something about finance, too, that you get defined into your roles as a function of essentially your entry point in the industry. And so I've noticed that me coming in 2001, think about it. Not really a great equity market. Dot com implosion, right? Absolutely. I mean, in the middle of it, obviously we had nine eleven. You had all kinds of crazy stuff that happened in the world, and so I've noticed that the people that came a few years after me tend to be more risk takers, 
right? Where we were a little bit more risk averse. So I think there's this anchoring of when you start one's career sometimes of how you get into a side of the business. Now, so, obviously, we can redefine ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. But I do think that there is something to be said about that. So again, this is a world where interest rates, you know, you got paid, unlike the last time we were here talking, right? right? Uh, when we had that finan- true financial repression for like 12 years. Um, and so there's something that was interesting about it, and inherently it's more mathematical in nature. And so um, as I was doing like risk analytics and, and working to help support some of the marketing staff and do that, um, you know, I gravitated to that side of the business a little bit. So my goal was to work for Mr. Gunn like I did not on day one. Uh, but I always felt that like there was something in there, just analyzing returns, looking at the history, looking at the team. And uh, my goal was to try to get on that team, and effectively I did. So so just a little bit of a trivia footnote. The very first Masters in Business that was broadcast just about 10 years ago, July 2014, episode number one, Jeffrey Gunlock, Double Line Capital. That's right. So I really, uh, really he, he, I, I owe him a special... Uh, debt of gratitude. So, so I, do, I do too, Barry. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he he still writes my paychecks today. Signs but, uh, him, right? Yeah, yeah. At TCW, you're uh, at the Trust Company of the West. You're senior vice president. You're a portfolio manager. You're a quantitative analyst. It sounds like you're wearing a lot of different hats. Are these sequential positions or were these all at once? Yeah, no, it's sequential. Um, you know, I started as a quant and then, you know, you get these corporate titles as things go along. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, you know, I, I liked being on the portfolio management side. And so devising strategies, coming up with ideas and trying to figure out different ways to execute them. I, I, that was always of interest. And so I worked a lot on the asset allocation side. And so um, I've had a lot of roles throughout my career, even though it's it's very narrow team, right? I said I've worked at the mm-hmm. same folks forever. You know, I've trafficked in a lot of markets. I mean, at one point I worked for a guy that wrote a very seminal piece on commodities. And so we created commodity products. Uh, we ran those for a few years. Um, again, as I said, we've worked in asset allocation. Um, I've helped build a lot of our quantitative strategies. We run at Double Line as well. And so it's not just me. I have a good team around me, too. And so I've always been able to surround myself with people who can right, think about these ideas and are really kind of big picture folks, and but it can also get into the minutia. And so not shockingly, I like quants, right? <laughs> I, I feel like we, we vibe, you know, we can we can get together. But I, I like the way that the quants think, you know, and so I've never I struggled when I took the CFA exam, not not with the whole curriculum, but obviously the accounting. I mean, I have a degree in financial engineering, and I took one accounting course. Right. Right. Uh, and so the statement analysis never made sense to me. It still doesn't. You know? Well, it doesn't have the same internal logic, the same you can't inherent it. mathematical rationality, where you just have to start with a basic premise, and so much no. things can be derived logically from that starting point. Yeah. This is just rules and yeah, and, and, and struggle and, with it. It's yeah. just, uh, especially if you're a left brain person, the yeah. right brain stuff, and vice versa. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned financial repression. You and the rest of the quants uh, in your core group, including Gunlock, decide to stand up your own firm in 2009. It's pretty much in the midst of people. The worst of the market, I think, was somewhat behind us. But still, people were shell-shocked. What was it like standing up a new firm right in the financial crisis, right in the midst of 2009? With the Fed, every week it seemed like there was a different new credit line, a different new way to unfreeze what was going on in the credit markets. Tell us about that period. Yeah, well, actually, the bulk of that period transpired at TCW. So the the oh seven oh eight for yeah, sure. And then, but even in 09, even 09, uh, there was there was still this was kind of the bounce back, as we all know. The lows were in March of 09. But what you found was that in we we left in December of 09. At that point, things were starting to have more clarity. Now, massive uncertainty in the world. And there's the old adage that investors fight the last war. Always. They're still fighting the last war, right? right? Every time, right? And so trying to show people this idea that, you know, investing in these mortgages that did did go down 50 or 60 percent, that there was significant upside in this and really limited downside. And so there was something special about that time as well. Um, where the opportunity set was extremely obvious, but it's never obvious, right? At the time, it wasn't obvious, 
We thought it was obvious. Looking back with hindsight, it was the best time to make money in fixed income. Can I tell you something about obvious? So we, full disclosure, we used to own the, way back in 09, 10, 11, 12, the double line mortgage backed portfolio. And it was obvious that, hey, you're buying these deeply distressed mortgages with an implicit federal guarantee. How are you not going to outperform plain vanilla mortgages? And that product for, I want to say like the next seven, eight years until yeah. you just couldn't buy any more mortgage back. Right. They just weren't available. Well, they weren't they weren't available at those prices anymore. That, that's so, for so sure. the difference is when you buy them at par, it's a lot different than buying that's, them at 50, right? right? But and that cr- that fund yeah. just destroyed all comers for years yeah. and years and years. Yeah. Am I overstating that? No. I mean, look, anybody who was in the space did similar, right? Mm-hmm. As long as you had- You and, guys and, were very aggressive, yeah. very early. And I want to say 75, 85% of the portfolio, at least in the beginning, was mortgage backs. So uh, no, it was almost 100, actually, oh, really? at the time, very early on, because it was blatantly obvious that you had two sides of the markets. Right. You had the government guaranteed side, which gave you interest rate risk, and you had this stuff that was so bombed out it had zero exposure to interest rate exposure. It was all about the credit. And as we said, you know, investors fighting the last war were saying, well, if they went down to 50, they must be going to 25. <laughs> right. So where you just say, hey, I'm buying, you know, Wells Fargo shelf paper with six coupons. Now, if you buy an asset with the six coupon at 50 cents on the dollar, and let's just think you think you're getting par back, that thing has an IRR like close to 30. Right. Right. Um, and that math probably doesn't jump out to a lot of people. But just think of current yield. It's got six, you divide it by 50. That's a 12 current yield. Mm-hmm. That's the cash flow. Now you have to assume some losses. And what we were doing was just running these bonds to like draconian scenarios where the world's ending. Right. If if, if house and these prices bonds are still profitable and, and they don't break, like right. they they don't they don't they don't lose money, especially at fifty cents on a dollar. But the biggest challenge, Barry, that a lot of investors had was say, well, you're buying this, but and we tell them, well, look, we think we're going to get seventy five cents on the dollar back. Well, why the hell would you buy this bond? Because I'm paying forty cents on the dollar. It does, yeah, but but people don't think that way. They're like, but you're not going to get par back. And by the way, if you don't get par back, these bonds go D for default in a ratings agency model. But who cares? But see, but that's not the mentality of. And people that was an unconstrained fund. fund, right? It wasn't like we have to buy conforming, right? Uh, fanning and fr- it's like uh, it was. It was all written in the prospectus. And by the way, the nice thing about starting a new firm is you can write prospectus the way you want. Right. No legacy and paper, you no garbage. You don't have with. to do it. You don't need to proxy vote it. You say this is how we want to run the portfolios, and so. It, w- it was a great time. Um, would I would I advise people, you know, five years ago or six years ago to set up a bond shop? No, but at the time, it was it was just everything was kind of in our favor. And the thing I remember is that the day we launched that total return fund at Double On, it was actually April sixth of of twenty ten. The and flash crash, right around the flash it, crash. It was a, it was a little bit prior to that. Mm-hmm. But why that was May tenth? I think. Yeah, that was later on. Yeah, it was. It, I don't know exactly the day, but it was definitely later. But why I remember that is I used to tell people that was the last time we saw a 4% tenure. It huh. was that day that we launched that fund, it was a 4% tenure. And it took us until 2022 to get back to that level. Hey, what's a dozen or years between, yeah. between friends? Yeah. It's so funny you specifically said what a great time it was in 09 to launch a firm, to launch a fund. I have a vivid recollection of walking into my training room in 08, 09, and just channeling Duval from Apocalypse Now. Remember the <laughs> yeah. Charlie Don't Surf yeah. thing? At one point, he turns to Martin Sheen and says, um, you know, son, someday this war is going to end with this bittersweet wistfulness. Like, yeah. this is the time. Yeah. You have to just recognize it. And I always thought it was much more applicable to markets than to war because, hey, it, when it's just hell out there and there's blood on the, in the streets yeah. – that's when the greatest opportunities come. It, it really is, and unfortunately, war never ends, as we know. Right? Mm-hmm. We, we continue to see that left and right, but definitely, markets are cyclical in nature, and you know, it's the same thing when valuation gets out of control too. It will come home to roost at some point, but doesn't mean the valuation can't get worse. Right? It can't go higher, and so what you have to you have to realize is that you've got to stick to principles. You've got to think through things, and you know, regimes change but they don't change that much, 
right? And so what I, I think in that is that if, if once you start hearing this time is different, this is the new era, um, typically those things are the signs of, of excess in the market. And look, I, I think that we've been through one of those recently as well. Um, I think we've had some excesses out there. On the fixed income side or on the equity side? On both, both. Huh. And so look, corporate spreads are tight today. Valuations are tight. They're tight for a reason. Um, but it doesn't, you know, look, corporate bonds being a little bit overvalued doesn't mean they're going to crash. Doesn't right. mean you're going to lose half your money. But the problem is in some equity markets, you can have that experience, right? Now, granted, bonds had a significant drawdown, um, as we all saw in 22. Uh, but from the standpoint of thinking about valuation, you know, credit spreads are not really reflecting much of a default premium today. Mm -hmm. And I think that's reflective of the economy. I think that's reflective of kind of where we are. But also, I think that's backward looking, not forward looking, right? And so, from that standpoint, do I get excited about you know when the OAS on corporate bonds is like you know inside of ninety basis points? Not really. Um, high yield got inside of three hundred, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago. That's not exciting. And what I hear from a lot of people is, and I'll hear it from the credit team significantly at the firm, yield buyer. There's a yield buyer. There's a yield buyer, and. There's a threshold of yields. All they care about is yield. Well, if you only care about yield, just go buy treasuries. They have yield, right? right? You have to get compensated for each risk. So when I say the excess in valuation, some of it does apply to the corporate market because, look, the economy has been very strong, right? It, I mean, last year was the, the recession. It was a massive recession. Remember, everybody forecasted right. it. And of course, when everybody does it, it doesn't happen. Hey, it's um, in the price already. I used to hear that early in my career already in the price and it used to be so frustrating and when that light goes on it's like hey if everybody is discounting a recession mm -hmm. then the market's figured it out a long time yeah, ago i also i also think what happened is that you know a lot of us are trained um especially from an economic background to look at in financial markets to look over year over year data mm -hmm. and the year over year data was flashing very negative and what a lot of us missed and i'll i'll, I'll take some some blame for this too we, we, a lot of us missed it was that it was the amount of excesses that came into the system during the pandemic that haven't worked through. And the the one I heard so much was excess savings. And I hated the phrase, the Fed used it, and it was like, here's the savings rate, but we pumped all this money in, so thus there's this excess savings amount that's out there. And I always tell anybody, Barry, if you know anyone with excess savings, I can help them. <laughs> we can take the excess off your hand. You can put it in and Bank of Sherman. generate some return. And no, you can just put it in the Bank of Sherman because to me, it's not an excess. All my savings I need, right, is <laughs> what I'm going at. There is no excess savings in the world. And so from my standpoint, that, that's what I would say. So call me if you have excess savings. Forget the investment. I'll just take it off your hands. It'll, it'll help all of us out. You, you, know? you sound like what I say every yeah. time someone tells me the dollar is being destroyed. Yeah. Well, send me your worthless what? US dollars for proper disposal. I'll, I'll take care yeah. of those. Yeah, don't worry what I'll Tell do you what, yeah. you take care of the excess savings. Yeah. I'll take care of the worthless dollars. We'll make sure no one has any credit. Right. And, and, and we're just helping the world out here, right? But <laughs> but so that phrase I hated, um, but there is a, there's kind of a corollary to it. And it's something that really, I think, is impactful. And it's still in the market today. And this was the amount of monetary growth. And this is what we call M2 inside of um, in, in the wonky economics world. And this M2 growth at one point with all the, you know, six to seven trillion dollars of money printed through all these support programs led to an increase in the monetary base of 28 percent year over year mm -hmm. to eight. I mean, that's an unprecedented Almost a number. third increase. Increase in the amount of money out there. OK. And so you can say that it was free money. You could say we gave free money to people. We gave it to corporations. We printed it. It existed. The Fed bought some of it through, you know. Through now, and this is on top of you. I, I'm not a big fan of the phrase financial repression. Mm -hmm. But to be fair, this is following about 10, 15 years of pretty aggressive monetary policy, including, you know, printer goes burr was yeah. the meme. Yeah. This isn't just an, in isolation. This follows a solid decade. Is that a fair uh, number of expansion of the monetary base it, it is and it's these um you know what was it friedman that said there's nothing more uh, permanent than a temporary government program right <laughs> um and that's that's absolutely true but when i think about it 
what you were starting to see is the year over year numbers. We were starting to see the M2 fall precipitously. Mm-hmm. And it was getting to a point where, you know, absent a war are going into like these, you know, coming off of these war periods. You've never really seen the monetary base shrink. We saw it shrink in late 22. To, to say if that's what is the fallible recession forecast. Yeah. You haven't even brought up the inverted yield curve. Well, well, hold which... on, but hold on, I'm not even done with this, Barry. This is because I think this is way more important than the yield curve. And oh, really? I, I have I have some ideas on the yield curve too that um, we'll get to. But the, what I, where I'm going with this monetary growth is that what you actually need to do is look at the two year number change, uh-huh. or look at the three year number change. And what you need to do is look at the trend line over the last seven or eight years, not just year over year. It. And what you would see if you did that trend line, and I put it in a webcast recently, the gap is still so massively to the upside of how much we created relative to this trend. Mm-hmm. And you can talk, you, you can do it over many, many years, and you get the same result. And so what that means is that there truly is liquidity in the market. We created these dollars and put them out there. And also, I think you put together the consumer. And what's happened there is that behavioral patterns have changed. So before we were talking about the expansion of the monetary base, I, I have to ask you, and we'll talk about the inverted yield cover in a minute, but, but given the fall off in the monetary base you, you mentioned, how do you contextualize that against just we went, I don't know, 15 years with kind of de minimis fiscal stimulus. Monetary was shouldering all of the yep. burden. Come come the pandemic, CARES Act won under uh, former President Trump. $2 trillion, biggest yep. fiscal stimulus, literally as a percentage of GDP, about 10% since, since World War II. CARES Act two, $800 billion under Trump. CARES Act three, almost a trillion and a half under Biden. And then you have... The infrastructure bill, the inflation reduction bill, the semiconductor bill, the PACT VA bill, these are giant 10 year fiscal yep. stimulus. Is the regime change from monetary policy to fiscal policy impacting equities more? Is it impacting bonds more? Or is just it's a new day and you have to start over? Well, I think what you see here is we realize that the fiscal stimulus drives the consumer. At the end of the day, and dumping money into the system has really, really changed that dynamic. Where monetary policy, you know, if you go back to Bernanke when they rolled out the QE, he always talked about the wealth effect. He, he's really telling you trickle down economics, right? That if people feel wealthier, they're willing to spend money. Do, right? By the way, do you, the way the Fed describes the wealth effect, do you buy that? It always smelled no. funny to me. No, I, I think it's I think it's stupid. Like I think trickle down economics is stupid. Right. Um, it, it's a theory, but in the real world, it just doesn't. it's what rich people say because they own assets, right? And they're like, if I if I owe more money, you know, like you know, Barry, I'm gonna probably give you some. Barry, I haven't given you any more money as I made more money, but in theory, I'm gonna do so, right? Cut my taxes. I'm gonna help you out. And I just I don't think it has this broad economic impact. Uh, I think it sounds good. That's why we all argue in politics. But I it just I, I'm not I'm not convinced that any of it works. I I 100 percent agree. And I can't help but notice that wealthy people and I mean very wealthy people, their spending happens whether the market's up 30 percent right. flat down, maybe during a crisis. Some of the more conspicuous consumption gets throttled back yeah. because, you know, Marie Antoinette and all of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But for the most part, uh, the wealth effect, it, since since 80% of stocks are owned by 5%, 10% yeah. of people, how big of an impact can the wealth effect have on the bottom 80% of... of uh, I think the only place that it could potentially happen is with the housing market. And so I think that's part of what you're seeing today and some of this as well. So we were talking about the M2 growth Mm -hmm. and the money supply out there. But don't forget, if people feel confident, they're willing to spend money. And I think part of this last push we've seen is that, you know, with the advent of Zillow and, you know, Redfin, and we can look up the price of our homes and we can creep on our neighbors and, you know, our friends, what do they buy? 
I think there, that has created something in the psyche of people that they feel a little wealthier if they're a, if they're a homeowner, right. but, especially, especially if the neighbor's house went for a, a butt ton of money. Right, but you, you used to have to see that transaction. Mm-hmm. Now we have this algorithm, and you can go log in every day and look at your house, and it moves every day, kind of. Or you know, it, it, it's. It, it, I think there is something in there. But well, let me throw a curveball at you because you mentioned psych, psychology and sentiment. Yeah. On the one hand, even though it's off the lows. Consumer sentiment has been awful, like below the financial crisis, below the dot com, yep. below 9-11. Yeah. But when we look around in the world of consumer spending, on the high end, you yep. want a Porsche, Ferrari, a Lamborghini, there's a wait list. Yep. On the upper medium end, you want to go buy a Rolex. You can't get them. They're, they're, they're getting per- cheaper, though. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah. But you probably can't buy a brand new one. Right? So, yeah, so it's, if it's you go to, to yeah. the certified pre-owned or yeah. even just the used one, um, a watch that cost ten grand MSRP that was twenty two thousand dollars used is now yeah. down to seventeen, yeah. but it's still much more than new because you can't get new. There's no supply of homes, or very at least dramatically reduced. Um, uh, you want to buy a boat or a jet ski? You'll wait a few months. It's um, it's uh, or or a big truck. All right, you could yeah. probably get the big truck. I got now. something you could buy. You can buy a Tesla right now. You know, there's uh, a lot of those on there's, there's a lot of those on offer right now. You know, we we. Mm-hmm. Maybe the takeaway from that is if your if the demographics of your primary customers are, you know, left of center, uh, save the planet, um, anti-global warming people, maybe owning the libs is a bad marketing strategy. Yeah. Yeah. But but that who knows? And there's also a ton more competition today in that space. Sure. Sure. Um, but my, I, I guess where I'm going with this is consumer sentiment. OK, so why why does it feel abysmal? Well, Let's talk about inflation. So instead of doing what what Jay Powell is doing or what all of us do, and they're going to cite the year over year inflation number. And by the way, the core PC is looking a little bit better after this last print. Sure. To um, but Jay has a problem. He's been talking about CPI for the last few years. Right. So moving the goal sticks is just not good for him right now. Um, and he doesn't need to do anything anyway. So he's. We can talk about that later. Listen, inflation but, came down regardless of what the Fed. But did. Here's it was the so late, and it, by the time they started. It, it was just about to peak and come down. But here's the problem. Now let's go back on Euro, not instead of year of year, let's go back two years. Let's go back three years. And if you ask people what inflation looks like, it, usually the common person will give you one of two statistics. They'll talk about their grocery bill uh-huh. or they'll talk about fuel pump prices. That, that's really how people think about inflation. But if you think about what's happening right now, I think people's anchor is pre-pandemic. And, and we're we're what twenty percent generally. You're, you're you're in the mid to high twenties now, and so that I think is weighing on sentiment, but it's not changing the dynamic of the spending. And I I also think this is part of the whole Fed's policy is that when you when you're hiking rates, you're you're trying to do two things to this transmission mechanism, make credit more expensive. They've done that. Okay, mission accomplished. But also to curtail cons- to curtail consumption, you also want to incentivize savings. That's the missing part in this, I believe. Mm-hmm. And I, I saw the, you know, the JP Morgan CFO come out. I'm no disrespect there, but he's complaining about how clients want CDs. But if, why he's complaining is because they're paying a basis point on their savings account. Right. And if you're you have a great relationship, you get two basis points. <laughs> well, there's there's your repression, Barry. You but, move to a money market, you're getting about five percent. Right, but right? that's called financial literacy, right? <laughs> so that's the gap My we bad. have here. Right. But it, it's true. And and this is not a U.S. phenomenon. This is a global phenomenon. Right. That there is just not this um, robust financial literacy. But so if you think about a person that I, I was contending probably two years ago going into 22 or sorry. Go, yeah. Going into 23 after we had higher rates that people are going to save money. I didn't realize that the banking system wasn't transmitting that mechanism. We work in capital markets, right? Right. So we and, know and what rates are. That's what six or seven trillion dollars, some crazy number. It was six trillion. We got to in money market. It obviously, went down because of tax payments a couple of weeks ago. Right. But the thing is, is that what you find is that that savings wasn't there. Now, I would have contended in twenty three that people thought inflation was going to continue at the nine handle, right, or the eight handle. And so they didn't think that that money market account was enough. 
Now I think it's that they're not getting paid on their deposits either, right? Yes, sophisticated people do. People we know do this. And our job is to educate more people. All my friends ask me about that don't work in markets. What, what should I buy? I was like, Janet Yellen's money market account. Government money market. <laughs> don't worry about it. I promise you, you won't lose What's money. What's the yield today? Yeah, What's Janet paying? Janet's paying about five and five and uh, five, five and three. three five, yeah. right. right. Yeah, it's, it's, that's an impressive. Listen, especially coming on top of a decade of practically zero, yeah. that's that's an oasis in the desert. It is, but so let's continue on this path of of why the consumer why the sentiment's so bad is because I don't think that what we see in the slowdown is the the savings rate go up. Right. If you look at the percentage of disposable income, they're they're really at, at well, that's low levels. Because you took all their excess savings. I haven't yet. I'm I'm making a plea. I'm making okay. a plea still. But where I'm going with this still is that I don't think people have been incentivized to save. And you know what? We have the YOLOs. They have the there was the idea that we, we were locked down for a year or two, depending on where your jurisdiction people is. People died. It's fair to say the my big takeaway from the pandemic, aside from hey, these vaccines are are a miracle, was life is short. Open that expensive bottle of wine. What are you waiting for? People who were like otherwise fairly healthy suddenly dying. Yep. You know, a lot of people had that moment of existential dread where, hey, I only got so many years left. Yeah. Let's go live life. That's right. And I think that that has changed the psyche. So if you want to talk about a regime change, I think that's changed. And I think that's missing in this Fed transmission mechanism right mm -hmm. now is that we're not curtailing this. Or we're not increasing the savings and curtailing consumption. We are spending still. And so from that standpoint, as long as people stay employed, that's gonna, probably going to continue. And by the and, way, we're here we, in April. We're in New York. Mm -hmm. It's actually a beautiful day outside. Spectacular. Right? And this is the seasonal part where you guys on the East Coast start to go out and spend more money, too. Out in L.A., we're, we're just drinking Doing it that sun round. all the right. time. Yeah, we do it all the time. But So the seasonal component will probably kick in here, too. So this is the idea of waiting for a catastrophe to happen. What's missing in a lot of this is also just the dynamic of the consumer. And look, people have criticized the labor market statistics, birth death models, all of that. But what I what I look at in the labor market today is I watch unemployment claims because we can argue about weekly service. unemployment claims and about a two hundred k a week yeah. now. Why do I pretty watch low? This? But why do I watch that? The one thing I can say is that I, I'm pretty confident in our fellow Americans. I mean, Barry, you've worked a long time in your career. You paid in the system, right? Sure. If Bloomberg lets you go, let's say Ritholtz doesn't want you anymore. That would be kind of weird, but it right. could happen. If what I are you probably going to do? Yeah, you, you may. You, you may just get matched. If I decide day. to pick up golf and yeah. spend my time doing that. But think. But but I want to go the other way. I want to say you lose your job. Uh -huh. If you lose your job, I'm pretty sure that most people don't have an issue going and filing those claims. So when I look at unemployment claims and not seeing spikes in that or continuing claims not being out there, to me it says something about – we can't dismiss the jobs data. right? Well, the labor market is tight. During the previous administration, legal immigration, yeah. I'm not talking about sure. people coming yeah. under the fence at the Mexican border, but yeah. legal people coming in dropped off about a million persons per year. Then you have the and pandemic. The pandemic took a couple million out of the workforce, but we've actually seen that that um, foreign-born cohort starting to, tick starting up to grow up. Again. It's above trend now. Right. So but you still have a very tight labor market with- yes. A shortage of available workers. That's right. That's going to keep wages up, and that's going to keep the unemployment claims down. And if you keep keep wages up, if people are making it, even though they may be living paycheck to paycheck, they are spending money. And so this is the thing you can't dismiss in the overall cycle. And so I think when you start to look at it and you take a different perspective versus year over year, and you go back a couple of years, you find that you're getting a different signal in the marketplace. And that's something that we had to recognize last year. Well, let's talk about that because you came into this year, you came into 2024 specifically saying, hey, rate cuts in March seems kind of optimistic to me. You were dead right. And I'm going to assume between the strength of the economy and sticky inflation, at least in the services and, and yep. apartment rental market, was the basis for that. The market's caught up to you. Yeah. I think the market has now uh, You got about removed. one and a half. You got one one and a half kind of cuts this year. And it's really June, backloaded. July, no, it's oh, way backloaded. You're, so, you're talking about 
you're talking about probably fourth, uh, like September or something. A lot of people will say, well, the Fed can't cut right in front of the election. They've cut every they, year during an election. They, they can that, cut. That's it's just it's wrong. crap. Right. It's this thing where they're going to be viewed politically. I, say, I tell the people, if the Fed cut 100 basis points two months before the election, do you think it changes the election? It does nothing. If anything, right? it's not in the cycle. If anything, that hurts the incumbent because it's saying, "Hey, there's something we need wrong." It. Right? What's going on? I know you're a data wonk and you're not afraid to dive deep into the numbers. Let me ask you a kind of counterintuitive question. I, I, I read a fantastic stat: um, half of the homes that are owned uh, that have mortgages, so only about 50, 60 yeah. percent of homes have mortgages, but half of the homes with mortgages. Have mortgages at four percent or less, and I think it's like two thirds at five percent. It's got to be high. I think it's well, at least in the agency market, which is easy to look at. If you look at, you can pull up the what's called the effective coupon of the mm -hmm. agency mortgage market. So the effective just means that you're taking it all together, the average, you're averaging it, right? And that number is about three and three quarters today. So much That's, refinancing took place. It took place, but this is also another reason for that strength of the consumer is yeah. that. Like corporate America, who was smart and refied their debt, and pushed, so did homeowners. Tree. So did homeowners. But this here's is what's the, caused an inventory problem because now. So that's I, where I, I wanted to go. Is that, how much has the Fed taking rates up and bringing forcing mortgages to seven and a half percent created a sort of persistent inflation, both in single family homes, um, apartment rentals, and and of course owners equivalent rent in. Yeah in BLS data for, for CPI, for Consumer Price yeah. Index, is it sort of perverse that the Fed raising rates yeah. has raised inflation or at least yep. made it sticky? Well, that's that's the whole that's the whole thing. If if I had told you rates were going to a seven handle on mortgages, I, I don't think you would have said that house prices go up from where we were when we were talking about a 2.5% <laughs> mortgage, right? Well, it's because of exactly what it's, you it's said. The, the supply is gone. So right. think about it this way. One thing we've been thinking about and we've been throwing around the table in, in some of our discussions is that what if the Fed cuts rates meaningfully? And what if mortgage rates come down 200 basis points? You'll free up a ton of inventory. And, prices will and go down. Prices my my contention is if, if mortgage rates came down 200, prices go down because you have a people that are landlocked or they're, they're stuck in this home. Golden handcuffs. Correct. And on top of that, you have you know a boomer generation that ultimately is looking to maybe downsize and things like that, where they'll, they'll just say at some point, well, now I can afford the mortgage on the smaller place, right? And I'm up so much on my home, I've doubled my price in the or last- Or even year. we added a second or third kid, we want a little more space right. to go from three and three quarters to seven and a half is exorbitant on the same size house. You want to add a bedroom or two. Yeah, it's much easier. Oh my easier. God, no yeah. one could do it. So, you know, you know, Nick Hanover of uh, Second Wave Capital has been talking about this exact issue, which is if the Fed wants- lower inflation, especially on the housing side, they need to lower rates. Yeah, and people seem to not wrap their heads around it. it you obviously it, get it. It's it's tough, though, because on the other side, think about what happened starting in November 1 of last year when the mm -hmm. Fed kind of authorized that, hey, let's start talking about cuts. And what you saw was really, I'm going to call it excess into the market, right? Rates rates rallied meaningfully. Spreads came in meaningfully. Equity prices went up meaningfully. Gold went up strangely meaningfully. Um, that That's the one I can't get my head around as much. Is gold. But, yeah. Well, how it went up so much recently. It's right. Just, it, went, while it ignored while, a decade while, while of have, printing. And, while, yeah. We have these real yields that are positive. It's everything you know has kind of been thrown upside down. Right. However- Crypto, all, all these speculative assets, and again, I'm, I'm not here to criticize any of them, are up. If the Fed truly believes the wealth effect, they think if you cut rates more, you fuel that again. And so that's another reason why, you know, coming into the year, I thought that the, we should be patient on the rate cuts. And, I, you know, it doesn't look that strange today, but a couple of months ago, I was telling people the biggest risk to the market is that the Fed doesn't cut this year. And people looked at me like I was insane, Barry. Right. Well, more insane than they usually do. Usually, I, right. Yeah, right. I mean, so there's a baseline there. <laughs> um, but but uh, I just said, like, why do we have to have cuts at this point? And what if the economy continues? Do you think the Fed wants to cut to have to turn around and hike again later on? Now, I'm not in the Larry Summers camp. Like, we should be hiking this year. I think we're just fine where we are. Who's left in the Larry Summers camp? He's been dead <laughs> wrong for a couple of years now. At what point do people say, maybe the 1970s and the 2020s 
are somehow different decades? You know, um, you know, maybe there's a thing called technology that's a little different. I, I don't know, but but where I'm where I'm thinking about it, all of this is that you know it's not just following the path of of what the market is telling you because remember the bond bond guys get a lot of credit for you know being smarter than than other folks and the bond market knows more than than other markets but remember we're just people too and that forward curve is a bad indicator of where rates are going it always has been and you know if you think about when rates how were about that dot down, plot yeah i mean look at where rates were pinned down in the early 2010s through the whole the whole decade of the 10s um, the market always had cut, hikes are coming, hikes are coming. So uh, effectively, I, I thought the market got way too giddy. Um, at this point, you know, uh, it's it's harder to make a decision now because it was very easy to say, look, I want to fade the forward curve. I want to continue to own some floaters right. in the market. There's nothing wrong with owning some floating rate debt. Yes, you got to be careful with it because they can be problematic. But I can buy floating rate mortgages, for instance, that right. are guaranteed by the government. They've got seven caps, meaning that. Mortgage, you know, the, the rates, and remember, these these were issued before. Um, they would have to go up to o- over seven before you're penalized. You know, they trade 100 over, right? Uh, that seems like a, a no-brainer trade for not taking credit risk, right? Now, you know, it's kind of priced, right, into the market. And so things aren't as exciting there. But as you, as you look through it, I just think there was just so much fervor that everyone thinks the Fed's going to go down in rates. But as I, as I tell people on the desk, what's wrong with yield? What is wrong with having a positive real yield? You the, sound like a bond manager. I know, and you know what? It's kind of funny because you know these these younger analysts and things. They they just think it's okay to have zero real yield, like that the rate should equal inflation. And I'm like, you have to have a premium, and I think that's also what's changed is because inflation has come back into the market. The bond folks are going to require an inflation premium, which means we need real yield. What and- was? Did you say this in one of your notes? Like the current crop of bond managers have never experienced a bond market where they were generating real returns, real yields relative to to rates. They only know decades going back to the two thousand of. Pretty close to zero percent Fed funds. Rate. Yeah, I think I said something like that. I won't say there's none out there because obviously we have but, some I mean, tenure, this, but this like a new lot of folks, generation of who the under forty crowd yeah. has never seen well, higher rates. Well, they had never seen a hiking cycle either. Uh, <laughs> they've never seen inflation. Briefly, like yeah. eighteen. Yeah, 16, I mean, yeah, we, you got a little bit, and I, I think I said that back in the sixteen era. Like, there's people out there haven't ever seen a hiking cycle that are making investment decisions. But you know, the thing about it is, is that that's why we have to be students of history. Right. We have to know some of the dynamics. But I think that's a Buffett quote. Right. Where not Jimmy, but Warren, where he says uh, <laughs> if history was all there was or past is prologue, then the richest people in the world would be librarians. Right. And so you have to have that in your toolkit. You have to have the behavioral side in your toolkit. But also you have to be willing to kind of just think about things differently. And, you know, that that's what's that's what's great about this business. And that's why I'm glad I didn't become a teacher, Barry, um, because I, think I, need- te- I teach through this. Right. I, I, I try to I try to help our analysts. I try to educate uh, our clients. And uh, to me, it's it's solving these mysteries all the time. It's way more fun than just teaching you how to how to do uh PEMDAS and, and figure out the order operations. And, and, and it's algebra. pretty it's pretty clear you made the, the correct choice. So I want to talk about what you're doing at the firm with some of the new funds you have, but I have to talk a little bit about how this year has gone for bond investors. What are we looking at? We're off about 2.5% in bonds. Nothing like 2022. Yeah. But it really seems like the bond market has been off sides. What, what's going on there? Yeah, well, you you got to rewind the clock. I mean, we were talking about year over year. You got to expand the window. So, yeah, we mm-hmm. all look in calendar years, but let's go back to November 1. You're up meaningfully in the bond portfolio, right? Last so year, right. We got a little sure. too excited. Look, we cut a duration back in, back in January, a little bit in our portfolios, especially on the intermediate term side. Um, we did so because I, I was just adamant that. J Powell was not going to let this thing keep going. We're not going to get rates down to you know th- three uh, three percent on the ten year. It just seemed ridiculous, and that, that was like a hundred basis points very quickly came out of the market. Yeah, it did. It it did, and um, Jay just added fuel to the fire uh, in December, and so I I was kind of licking my wounds for a little bit and saying, man, that was a bad call. I'll own it. Here it looks like a good call now, but. 
the thing is, is that, you know, if you roll back the clock, bonds have done very well in the last 18 months or so since since we really got to those kind of peak levels. Yeah, we had that 5% tenure last year for about, I don't know, why you were Minute? sleeping. Right. Yeah, it was it was overnight, really, what you saw. And, I, look, I think we're going to try to test it again. And so we've been in the stance that coming in the year that bonds probably have, uh, you know, rates probably – fluctuate around they probably go up in the first half of the year maybe you get something that stabilizes here it just depends on the outcome of the economy but as a bond investor there's nothing wrong with having higher yields you know and so if you were patient (laughs) and you weren't aggressive with this bond allocation you got a good rally in january don't forget right so we got rates pretty dang low in january and then it just got sucked out all of a sudden because the inflation data came in right still a little hot right. right and so ultimately I, look, I, if I'm sitting at the Fed, there is zero urgency of cutting rates at this right. point. Uh, you know, my my argument has been, yeah, the inf- CPI is coming in hot, but to quote George Box, all models are wrong, but some are useful. OER, the the yeah. apartment side, it's on such a lag. It's but just so ta- but just take take the services exit. Let's look at the super core stuff. It, it's it's not comforting, and that's because people are spending. Right, they are yeah. spending. Oh, absolutely. You know? and, and so, forget the OER side. Strip it out. That's what that's what Jay was trying to do. Right. Uh, but Supercore is now annualized at like four percent. If you take Supercore PC uh, CPI, so he has a problem still. Um, and why, if the economy is still performing, people aren't losing their jobs. What what are we? T- why are we asking the, for rate cuts? What is the the incessant ubiquity of doing it now? Other than freeing up that supply of housing, bringing yeah. rates down. And let, let me talk about something else that I want to ask you about. So it's pretty well understood that huge invest, huge advantage for equity index investors if you have a 10-year time horizon. However, when we look at fixed income index investors, uh, it seems that a skillful bond manager can – do better than the the Bloomberg Barclays bond debt uh, for a variety of ways. Uh, you, you can you can make duration choices. Yep. You can make credit quality choices. Twenty twenty two was a tough year for bonds. Yep, down about fifteen percent across the Barclay Ag. Um, you guys are are discretionary, unconstrained. Bond managers, what were you thinking during 2022? Well, look, remember, remember, even though we have some of that, you have guardrails and you have to own some duration, and like right. th- th- there's there's limits to how unconstrained right. or unconstrained really is. Um, and so, you know, what we were seeing in that market was just pain, right? And what you also have to remember, if you're running a bond fund, you're providing liquidity. And remember, when bonds go down, people sell bonds, just like when stocks go down, they sell stocks. And so what happens during this, too, is that you're forced to sell. Everybody's forced to sell. There's no money to go buy things. And so we all complained about the same thing. Look at the value in some of this stuff, but it keeps going down. Right. right? And so I think what you see in today's market, I don't think we're going to have a repeat of 22 at this point. Why? We're not starting with a 1% tenure. Right. Right? You know, Or Fed funds at zero. Or Fed funds at zero. You're starting where you get yield. So- Basic math today says if I own a four and a half percent tenure and it has a duration, you can call it seven and a half, maybe it's closer to eight today. That says that okay, if I think about that ratio between the yield and the duration, that tells me how much yields can go up in a calendar year, mm-hmm. and my yield will offset it, right? So that's how I break even with a duration trade, and so. From that standpoint, there is some value in it because I do believe that if we do fall apart in the economy, if we have problems, I do think the 10-year rallies. I don't know if it rallies like it has historically because of the debt loads that we see out there, because of the big deficit. And this is the other side of it. We need some inflation, Barry. We need nominal GDP growth. We've got to grow ourselves out of these deficits. But the problem is, is that we've we've changed the, the the script, and something changed under the previous administration, where during the good times, which th- that era was pretty good, right in the sure. sixteen era, we actually expanded the deficit historically. Right. Historically, we decreased the deficit. To be fair, least, a lot of it was pandemic related. No, 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 no. It, no, I'm saying the path that Trump had us. I almost say Trump. Let, let's say the entire Congress had. Right, right. We were spending more money. We were increasing the budget deficit on an annual basis. It's the first True. time 
really in the last 70 years, we've seen it absent a war. Right. Okay. And so, Fair enough. And then we've continued it during this administration. Right. So there's no change on which team you play on here politically. It, they're, they're, they're both bad for bond Wait, market. people in D.C. spend money they don't have? That's right. Uh, and, wait, let and, me write Yeah, yeah. Down. So and I know breaking news, put, put that on the marquee for Bloomberg right. today. But the thing is, is that, you know, we, we, aren't, we aren't keeping the House in order. And so I think it's going to be fearful next time we have a recession. So my boss has been talking about this for a while now. And it's not that this is a 2024 problem. The deficit is not a 24 problem. But when we have another recession, what if Congress sees what we did during the pandemic and says, you know, we should print 15% of this GDP. This fiscal stimulus thing seems it, to work. It work, and it that does That Kings work. guy, he yeah. knew what he was talking about. He knew about. he's talking about. But also, there is an, a ramification on the other side of inflation. And the bond market will sniff that out quickly. So I think you can get a rally going into a recession. But once the fiscal authorities start to act... You may not want to be owning that bond. You may have wanted to rent it over that period. Let, let me ask you my pet peeve question, not so much from the prior administration, but from the era before the pandemic when rates were zero for a decade. How big of a missed opportunity was it? So households refinanced, yeah, I know. corporations refinanced. Congress said, no, no, we have no, you know, if we refinance, it'll just encourage more spending. Well, look, historic- it's like the single dumbest thing I've it, ever heard in my life. It, it, okay, th- th- that is. But let, let me give them a little bit of credit. And I'm not here to to give Congress credit or, or the Treasury at all. But historically, the Fed, I'm sorry, here I am screwing this up. Historically, Treasury um, has issued more short than long. Right. right. And that's because of the shape of the yield curve right. effectively. But also there's a, there's an argument that most people miss in this, Barry. And what it is, is remember, the Treasury market is one of the most liquid markets in the world. Sure. Except during March of 2020, right. nothing was liquid. Right. I mean, our our or, Treasury or, folks that trade in the 80s, by the way, they were telling us that they've never seen such a horrible market. Worse than, you know, September worse 08? Than, worse Lehman than, oh, absolutely. You, 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 there was liquidity in that stuff. You, you couldn't trade off the runs. You couldn't trade. Mm-hmm. They, they wouldn't even trade. Wow. You couldn't make an appointment. You couldn't call someone to, to try to do it. On the run stuff, you were hard pressed to do 10 million bucks. Wow. No desk wanted risk at all, and even treasuries. But where I'm going with this on the whole liquidity is remember, we have a term structure of rates. We we advertise our auction calendars, right? The quarterly refunding announcements, right. which there's one right. coming up, by the way. Um, and they've been pretty mediocre the past few ones. That yeah, and this one looks a little scary. Janet's got a lot of work to do. There, she's right. issuing a lot of front end paper this week. We'll see how that gets digested. But but, but let me just hold, go hold on back. real quick. Let's go back to the term structure. Because okay, they need to have the market. You can't just say all we're going to do is issue fifty year treasuries. You can't just do all that. Should they have issued some? Yes. The when, market when the Fed report. was at zero and ten years were at one percent. I get it, but you they can't, couldn't have done thirty years at three and basically you, change the. But you would have no liquidity for the next few years if you took the entire i'm saying at the extrema right, right. so if you but, went out there you, you you could put some into it but the treasury market you have to have this functioning market of people rolling paper and moving around there are people that buy 30s and lock them up right, right. they're called they're called sovereign funds um, but in general you've got to have some dynamic of providing that liquidity to different points on the curve don't and disagree so, and so there is something to be said now should they have done as much on the front end absolutely not but they were short-sighted, thinking about the zero. Look, you could have done a you could have done a fifty-year sub two at that really? point in time. Oh yeah, you definitely could have in the market. Remember, the long bond in twenty twenty got to one. Right, that's right. one exactly. That was the low in yields, and so you could have done stuff like that. Two, two, and, and the market percent. clamored for that. So remember, yeah. the, I mean, there was there was yeah. like this Austrian hundred-year paper that traded with almost a negative yield for a while. Right, hundred years, and um, you know. So ultimately, when you pull it all back together, some of it is just the function of the market they couldn't do, but they should have done some of it because there was a massive demand for it out there, specifically in the eurozone, where a positive real yield or a positive nominal yield would have cleared the market very strongly. But you couldn't take the entire budget and do the whole thing. And obviously, you can't refi all of the United States, but you certainly could have made. The circumstances where we are today, you, much you could, less. You could have made it better. Right. Uh, and again, I'm not trying to give them a lot of credit, but I'm giving you the reason why some of it is there. And it's also in, it's this entrenched thinking that they have to issue short. So let's come back to a couple of, of um, funds that you guys run. I got to start with, I don't know who coined this, but the first person I heard say it was you. What do you make of the idea of T-Bill and Chill? Oh, 
look, I, I it's been a great place. If if you're a T bill and chill person, meaning that you just buy T bills, forget your bond allocation, it's worked for you. Congratulations. When does that stop working? At some point, it does, and it has risk. And I, I tell people that, and they're like, "Well, yeah, we could default." I'm like, "No, that that's not the risk I'm talking. It has refinancing risk. Right. right? Every month, your T bill and chill. If Jay cuts rates, you you don't get to chill as much. And so, at some point, you gotta you, you gotta move it out a little bit. But that phrase alone is working. And Jay has given you a renewed sense on life there. You got at least another six months, right? You got at right? least a few more months. But the question is, what if they surprise you, right? So again, we all think we know, but we, what we all know is we don't know. Let's talk about right? surprise because the Fed has been so transparent and there have been criticisms from a variety of quarters that, hey, you know, the Fed is more effective when it can occasionally shock the market. My fantasy is... Jay cuts in June, startles the market, yeah. and then we have a little bit of a reset. If he did that, I think the knee-jerk reaction would be to sell things, and because it would, it would. The, Which the market, he doesn't mind. Yeah, the market would say that the takes Fed the knows something. Out, right, that they takes the, the consumer. Yeah. It, it does all these things that he says he wants. He wants to calm down the yeah. consumer. He wants to calm down. It's not going to happen. Barry. You, you I know want it, it was. It isn't. Happen. But if I was a birdie whispering in his ear. Yeah. Just 50 basis When's points the last time Jay shocked happens. the market? Um, they didn't even shock the market with the 50s and the 75s. They, right. they went to Nicky Leaks, right? As right. You know, one of the banks called him. And Nicky so, Leaks. Oh, yeah. my. Nick Timorosis at the Wall Street yeah. Journal. I don't even say that's why I call it. I can't pronounce the last name. Nicky so Leaks, I, I, that's yeah. great. But, it, but what you see is that they don't. And who shocks the market today? The BOJ. And look at what it creates. It, it's not what the Fed wants because there's ripple effects. If the Fed shocks... Then the ECB does too. If you notice, the ECB follows our lead in all yes. of this right now. So it's much more dangerous for Jay to shock the market. And they feel like they want forward guidance to be there. And that's what they set off back in November. So, uh, all right, 25 bips. So, uh, in but, June. but what does it matter? It doesn't change anything we're talking about. 25 Other than basis. housing. Not 25 basis points yeah, does not right. change the housing yeah, right. market, Barry. Come on. All right. But here's the thing T bill and chill. Um, you should be moving out the curve a little bit. Look, bu buy one year. Like we run low duration funds for these reasons. Right. You know, look, they've been great for for clients. You can pick up yield. So from my standpoint, there's better things to do. But look, my cash sits in money market. Right. right? And look, I'm I'm ready to to move some of that out. And look, I'm looking for yields like 475 on tens. I think it's a great point. I think when we have our next conversation, was every five or six years you invite me. We could we when can, we do we that. Can tighten that. But, but when we do that, what we'll do is uh, we'll We'll review this, and I, I know you you have it all recorded, so uh, I'll be on tape for that. But I, I think you're you're going to want that for this period. All right, so let's talk about two other funds that you guys have launched: the equal weighted ETF focused on Fortune 500, yeah. where you're ranking the holdings by revenue, very uh, smart beta ish or yeah. fundamental beta, whatever you want to call it. Tell us the thinking behind the equal weight ETF with the Fortune 500 revenue basis. So first of all, what it does, the Fortune 500 list published annually, right? Uh, it includes public and private companies. So ah. before I say that, we're not investing in the private companies. Okay. okay. So it's all public. But what happens is that it's U.S. domiciled names. Mm -hmm. So you don't have any conglomerate, you right. know, like a Schlumberger or something that's creeping into there, like an S&P. And it's very, you know, um, it's very rules based, right? You just rank on revenue. So what this does, if you compare this to like the S and P five hundred, there's about on average in any given year, uh, let's call it one hundred and ten to one hundred and thirty different names that are in the S and P. So we all know that there's equally weighted S and P out there. Sure. Um, and what we find is that this through a cycle does significantly better than equally weighted. But, and, and in today's and environment, is, and this is revenue ranked, not market cap. Not right? market cap ranked, and how they deduce it. You don't have some subjective committee like an S and P that comes in mm -hmm. there. So names that are growing and actually generating revenue show up sooner in this index than it would in the S and P. And if they're not yet profitable because they're reinvesting, they they're, still show they're, up. They're at out. The top. So you, you're going to be way underweight, like services as a uh, software. Software as a service. I always get that backwards. Software as a service, you're going to be under, you're going to be like some of these tech names too. Unprofitable tech isn't in there. Um, so you're going to have some more industrial type names. You're going to have more value kind of names over a cycle. But in general, um, these are still names you know. And when you look at the list, it's like, okay, but what it ends up doing is it gives you a different cohort to play with. Huh. And what you find is that these names get overlooked because they're not in the S&P 500. And so over time, you know, if you go back and compliance would hate me on a back test or anything, but you can generate about 150 over the S&P equal weight 
per annum. Wow. And look, if you can do something like that, and we all know over long term, equal weight tends to do better than market cap. Now, we go through periods with the late 90s. We had the one we just been through. And so for us, the timing perspective was very interesting because at the end of the day, we, we couldn't, it's hard for us to really love the Mag 7 or now it's down to four or five. Who, who even knows what? We changed it all. It right. was a the fang, fantastic a fang, four, fang, right? Um, you know, we Went from the, Fang double A yeah. to Mag 7 to Fantastic. Yeah. So let's talk about yeah. another fund which is avoiding the Mag 7, yeah. which is the double line Schiller Enhanced Cape. Yeah. And I know you can't say this because of compliance, but I could say top 1% of large cap value crushing 14% a year for the past three years, beating the S&P 500. Why did you guys partner with Schiller to come up with the enhanced cape other than the obvious performance? <laughs> I mean, like it, it, it fills with us philosophically. One, as a bond manager, we are sector rotators, right? So that's something we focus on. And the other thing we focus on is valuation. So if what what the Schiller methodology does is that it's 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 looking at the relative cape ratio so it takes the cape ratio of each sector and compares it to its own history. So it says it's for each sector of the market where are we in the cycle effectively. Mm -hmm. And it ranks them and just says which are the cheapest, which are the most rich. So you avoid the rich, buy the cheapest, right? So you take the universe, there's 11 sectors, cut it in half, call it 5. Five cheapest what you want to look at, and you apply momentum like any good academic would do to control for for kind of the value trap, and you're left with four, and you equally weigh them. It's as simple as it gets, Barry. You know, there is something to be said for bond managers being better PMs on the equity side yeah. because of the focus on valuation, return of capital, and and just tracking the math in a way that the equity side tends not to. Yeah, but look, they'll beat us through different parts in time. The the, long, the goal is to have a long tenure, and if you can do it over a full cycle and you can do much better, then why wouldn't you do it? All right, so I have to get at you out of here sooner rather than later. So let's turn our favorite five questions into a speed round. Perfect. Answer these as quickly as you can, starting with... Tell us what you're streaming these days. What are you watching or listening to? Uh, one of my colleagues uh, turned me on to something called The X-Files and told me <laughs> that you should watch this because it holds the truth up is very out well. There. And exactly. That's what I was going to end with. But yes, um, and it actually does hold up pretty well. So anyway, um, so, something that uh, I've been revisiting. I, I don't have any of the new ones out there. It's 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 kind of plus, the plus Duchovny was uh, and Jillian. They're they're both so yeah. fantastic. And you got to remember the song David Duchovny. Why don't you love me? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your early mentors. Although I kind of have a feeling who those are going to be who helped guide and shape your yeah. career. Yeah, that's I I think I mentioned this before when we were here but uh, there was a guy I worked with named Claude Herb too on mm -hmm. the commodity side um, really really a guy that taught me to question everything and then there was this guy uh, named Jeffrey Gunlock too very mm -hmm. very kind of prominent guy who um, said not only question everything but question it again, you know, too and and that's very helpful and also I think what was what's been very good about Gunlock and why he has such a loyal crew around him is that all of us are really pushed to challenge each other. And there's no dumb questions. Yeah, we'll call each other dumb at times. You know, we're we're like a family that way. But it's it's encouraging people to come up with ideas. And we're an idea business, right? You have to create. You have to you have to have new things in the market. And we want people to poke holes. And I think that's something that's very good about the team is that it's not being a contrarian for the sake of being a contrarian. But what are we all missing when we're all nodding vertically up and down? Mm -hmm. You know. That's the time where you question, and like that's what we've been doing at our last asset allocation meetings. It's like we've been sitting around going, credit looks expensive, but we don't want to sell it, and we're all cringing, and we're all just saying, okay, we're just gonna let it run for right now. And you know, Gunlock keeps saying, I just want to make everyone aware. We keep doing this each month. I'm not, I don't have another idea right now, but it's starting to say where maybe rates look pretty decent too. How do you hedge credit uh, short of going out and buying credit default swaps, and and they're not cheap. No, you, you really don't. Um, if you're having to hedge your credit, you shouldn't own it. That's one thing I've learned because the hedge huh. costs you money. If you want to hedge the credit, maybe you shouldn't own it. And the best hedge out there, I think, today are longer-dated treasuries. I think they work. 
I think huh. if we have a meltdown, and I'm not saying credit spreads widen 10 basis points. I'm saying- Extended duration out. isn't going to hurt you. It's not going to hurt you, and you get paid to do it. So that's a hedge that, that makes you money. It's what we call a positive carry hedge. There you go. Let, let's talk about books. What are some of your favorites? What are you reading yeah. right now? Yeah, I think I said to you last time was Against the Gods by Bernstein. That oh, hasn't changed. It's, I, that's, so, it's a classic. I, everybody really should read that out there. Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of, of the Michael Lewis stuff. I, I know he got a he got a bad rap with the- the latest one too about going um, infinite SBF. yeah on sbf i thought I that it. was a lot of fun if you read it i think a lot of people read like 50 pages and thought oh he's a fanboy this is michael lewis he's building a character first of exactly. all exactly you know if you haven't read any of his other stuff then maybe you can get there but if you read the whole book he's pretty caustic at the end right uh, i mean he 100 percent. right it, it was it's total lewis and so i, I think that people that was cri were criticizing up front but um, Chip Wars is the one that someone recommended that keeps to me. coming up. I love man. it, everybody and I think everybody should, everybody should read it. That is where it's at. You talked about the CHIPS Act. I think that's the only great thing that's come out of Congress in this last you know, kind of rounds. Uh -huh. I think building the chip plants, getting our own security that direction, and being a preeminent player there is extremely important. Huge. I've always Absolutely hated huge the iPhone where it says designed in Cupertino, right. but it's manufactured somewhere else. Right. They forgot that part out. They only kept the Cupertino part. I think this is something very powerful. Why would you not want to be the next TSMC? Why right. not? And or, we, we or could call bring it USMC. them here. They're building right. a plant in Arizona. Right. We they? could call it USMC, but we got a few of those already. <laughs> you know, so, um, so yeah, I the Marine like, Corps. You don't want to piss those guys off. You know, I'm a big fan of the Marine Corps. I, they, I do not want to say anything. And shout out to the the Marines out there that take care of us. Uh, by the way, I loved the Michael Lewis going infinite. Um, if you want a different perspective, that's every bit as well written and entertaining. Just a little more horrifying. Mm is uh, Zeke Fox's number go up. Okay. Which it which is really a you read the two of those and now you know everything you need to know All right. about about I'm, FTX crypto and I got a flight back to LA later in the week so uh, I'll I'll take a look at it. Our final two questions, what sort of advice would you give a recent college grad interested in a career in either applied mathematics, bond management or investing? Um, I think you need to uh, stray from what you've learned thus far, meaning that if you're the mathematician, you need to learn another side of the business, learn the fundamental side, which is something that I didn't appreciate. Um, be a student of history. That applies to everyone. Unless you're a history major, then you already know that. Um, but a student of history, financial markets rhyme a lot of times. They're, right. they're not the same. But you'll learn a lot through that. And you'll learn that a lot of things, we've, been ex we've experienced these things before. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, learn psychology. Learn the behavioral side, realize we're all people. There is no smart money, dumb money. It's all ran by people. Institutions are ran by people. Um, they behave a little differently because of their own career risk. Uh, your hedge fund's gonna behave a little differently because of its career risk, but understand that all these dynamics are in play. So the last advice I have when it comes to this, and the CFA Institute hates it when I say this, yeah. um, you know, and I've, I've given a couple of speeches recently and I, I, I put that caveat out there. Fundamentals work. They just can be they can they can be off for a while, right. and ultimately fundamentals come home to roost. Technicals teach you how to trade. T technicals there's levels like they, they work relatively well because of the psychology, um, so that leads into psychology. But the one thing you can never ever ever ignore is money flow. Money flow is the most powerful thing. If people are buying, price go up. People are selling, price go down. Mm -hmm. And when you see that in the market, when you see that, that's called momentum. Right. You know, to the quants out there, that is the most powerful force in the universe over a short-term time frame. So if you can marry those three things together, that's that can give you success. How do you track money flow? Well, you watch fund flows. We watch ETF flows. Uh, we watch ETF creation units. Um, you watch also the demand from the institutional when it comes to RFP demand. So all of these things are somewhat in our toolkit. Mm -hmm. But remember, we talked about M2. That's a powerful force as well. When uh -huh. we print money and create money, that that has to go somewhere, right? Right, and you got to track where it's going. It, it goes where it's treated best, and water finds its levels. That's exactly right. Our final question: What do you know about the world of investing today? You wish you had in your toolkit. You wish you knew twenty five yeah. years or so ago when you were first getting started. It's that behavioral aspect, hands down, hands down. Um, that you know, when I came in as a naive quant, I thought math solved the world. You can model everything, right? Um, and I realized that you know the models, they're guides. 
um, everything we have in the toolkit's a guide because it's people making decisions and we are inherently strange creatures right we do not act in our best interest mm-hmm. right um, we, we don't we are not utility maximizers um, you know to, to borrow the economic phrase and so uh, at the end of it I think it's understanding that dynamic of psychology is very important how does one model psychology you don't but you know it, you can kind of feel it, and there's something about markets where we say we feel something's happening, that means we're talking about that psychology. Well, what's the famous Richard Feynman quote? I know I'm gonna mangle this, but uh, if you think physics is difficult now, imagine what would happen if electrons had emotions, <laughs> right? That, I mean, F- Feynman is, is, is amazing. Uh, there's actually something on Twitter where someone does Feynman yes. quotes. Yes, I, I, I love, love that, that too. And, um, is Twitter still around? I've been, you know, sad, sadly watching it circle the drain. Yeah, I mean, um, I think it, something happened with the management there. I don't know. It, it kind of right. changed the dynamic. So um, I, I actually haven't been using it as much uh, myself Same. either. And so, But um, the glory days of Twitter, peak Twitter was a fabulous period. It was. And I remember you giving me some advice, Mary. Me? Uh, Barry, so you, me? you can go on to the mentor list with this. I think Get this is we should wrap it up. Oh, let's hear this horrible you, advice. All I right. So I was a, a young guy in here sitting here because I was younger than I am today. And the thing you told me about I was Twitter, I was like, it's so just a horrible, it's a cesspool and all of this. You said, true. Which you, that's great advice, right? You were like, yeah, true. And you said, if you want to do it, block and curate. Oh, block, the list. Yes. Oh, 100%. And you know what? It changed my life. Block really? And curate. Because I got what I was looking for. Now, I have some self reference in there. And that's the other thing. But going back to your previous question, follow people who you don't want to follow. Follow, follow ideas. Get outside of your ideological outside, bubble. Correct. Understand the other side. And you may not understand it, but listen to it. And it'll make you better for doing that because you got to realize that no one has your experience. They have their experience. And so to put yourself in someone else's shoes and try to try to grow from that, it's very important. And don't just read everyone who agrees with you. It's really fun for me to walk on the desk. I was like, yeah, yeah, great job, Sherman. Yeah, yeah. Well, if it's not truthful, it doesn't matter. Poke holes in it, and I think that's the thing we're all looking it, for. It's as if every trade has a buyer and a seller. It's funny how that works, right? That's why like prices went up. There's more buyers and sellers. By definition, there can't be. Uh, you know, By just, the way, that yeah. as someone who yeah. started on a trading yeah. desk, that expression has always annoyed me because the true expression is more buyers than – why are stocks up today? More buyers, buyers than at a sellers price. at this level. Yes, Once correct. you exhaust the sellers at this level, now you go up. Thank you, Jeffrey, for being so generous with your time. We have been speaking with Double Lines Jeffrey Sherman. He is Deputy Chief Investment Officer at the firm, helping to oversee about $100 billion in fixed income and equity. If you enjoy this conversation, be sure and check out any of the 500 plus discussions we've had over the past almost 10 years. You can find those at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you find your favorite podcast. Be sure and check out my new podcast, At The Money, expert conversations about earning, spending, and most importantly, investing your money. Find that wherever you find your favorite podcasts or in the Masters in Business feed. I would be remiss if I did not thank the crack team that helps put these conversations together each week. John Wasserman is my audio engineer. Atika Valbrun is my project manager. Sean Russo is my researcher. Anna Luke is my producer. I'm Barry Reynolds. You've been listening to Masters in Business on Bloomberg Radio. Bloomberg Radio.